Noswaitha, good evening. Hope you're all well. I'm intending to cover some stories that I haven't touched upon as yet. The three romances of the Mabinogion are different to the four branches of the Mabinogi. For those of you who may be a little bit confused by all the Mabinogis and Mabinogions going on, the four branches of the Mabinogi were written down in manuscript sometime between 1060 and 1120 to be exact. They're probably amongst the oldest stories we have copied down and in all there are 11 Welsh prose classics including the four branches of the Mabi Nogi that were brought together um, under the one title of the Mabi Nogion a couple hundred years ago now. But the Mabinogion derives its title from that Mabinogi and the four branches of the Mabinogi. So originally it's not clear whether the three romances were considered Mabinogi stories. That's merely a modern classification that we've given them. But nonetheless, they are stories of a comparable nature. They're not exactly the same. Uh, they have a slightly different flavour to them, but they do cover broadly the same subject matter and the, and the same topics. The three romances are interesting because it appears as though they were originally Welsh stories or perhaps originally Brythonic stories, so very, very early on in the evolution of Welsh culture that were somehow either transmitted to uh, Brittany, to uh, Lladau, and then they were taken on by a very talented uh, Breton or French storyteller by the name of uh, Chrétien de Troyes, who of course gives us several stories that become the sources for the later Arthurian cycles of Europe. After Chrétien de Troyes creates his versions of these old stories, perhaps originally Brythonic or Welsh stories, uh, they then return to Wales uh, and they're copied down in Welsh manuscript uh, probably sometime in the 13th century. So 150, maybe 200 years after uh, the four branches of the Mabinog have been written down. Of course, the Arthurian cycles that evolve after Chrétien de Troyes period are almost certainly the most popular body of stories uh, in Europe for a very, very long period of time. They're very potent, they're very evocative, um, they're very accessible. So, of course, my interest as someone who uh, has a fascination for mythology uh, and for folk mythology in particular that is, the remains of people's beliefs as we find them in the stories they told themselves. Over the years, I've become more and more fascinated with folk culture as opposed to the high culture, if you like, of medieval Wales. But nonetheless, for someone with uh, a fascination in different types of mythology, they pose a bit of a, a problem because they've always been considered to be more literary works than perhaps the four branches of the Mabinogi, at least until pretty recently. The four branches of the Mabinogi were kind of always regarded as originally stemming from an oral storytelling tradition. But because of Chrétien de Troyes uh, versions uh, almost a thousand years ago now, um, because their written versions from a basically medieval French culture, we've always assumed these stories to be written stories. But I would argue that there are many common motifs in the three romances, motifs that we find not just in the four branches of the Mabinogi, but also in the other Welsh prose classics of medieval Wales, uh, and story motifs that we can actually find all over Europe, uh, uh, if not uh, in other uh, cultures from across the world. So they're interesting in that sense too. They're not just pure novel-like literary stories. They do uh, contain threads uh, and elements that belong to the popular mythology of Europe. So I'm going to be talking about them in those terms. But I'm not 
really going to be referring that much to the academic literature concerning the three romances. <gasps> Naughty Gwilym. This is for a very particular reason. Um, of course, as someone who spent a long time in university, uh, studying in a formal academic setting, um, I'm very familiar with how academic work should be carried out. But in all honesty, I'm more of a, a creative thinker than a scholarly researcher. What I mean by that is that I am primarily a musician who happens to be an accidental academic. And by today, I tend to approach these texts in more of a creative fashion than I do a scholarly fashion. That's not to say that there isn't any value to be had in academic research, but academic research only satisfies one part of my intellectual curiosity, if you like. There's another part of me that is also inspired by the stories that I engage with. One way in which I engage creatively with stories is to interpret them. Now, interpretation isn't a very fashionable or sexy pastime for academics in the modern era. It's just not. We could think of uh, hermeneutics, the sort of traditional interpretations of the Bible, for example, uh, that were very popular in the 20th century, early part of the 20th century. But that style of interpretation has essentially gone out of fashion. It's kind of looked down upon these days. To be frank, that's the closest academic tradition I can find to the type of thing that I'm interested in. The main issue with biblical hermeneutics, and in fact any type of interpretation, is that it's very difficult to make objective arguments for any interpretation you may come up with uh, about any type of story. The way I've been getting away with it on the Magic of Meaning course, for example, the course I run on the four branches of the Mabinogi, is to at least look at similar stories from similar traditions, either stories that are similar within the Welsh tradition itself, or stories from Ireland, or stories from elsewhere in Britain or Europe, but at least comparing motifs from the four branches of the Mabinogi with motifs from other stories and discussing the similarities and in that way arriving at an interpretation and saying well if there is a similarity between these stories we can say that this may be a common cultural trend and therefore we can theorize that this interpretation may have made sense in the historical past. Considering all of that and considering how I've slowly but surely been moving away from hermeneutics and moving away from theories of literary criticism and what have you, um, I feel a lot more comfortable approaching a text clean. And what I mean by that is simply approaching a story as if I had never heard of it before uh, and as if I have no access to its historical setting. Radical, I know, but there is a reason for this. From my interest in anthropology and my interest in um, sort of cultural production, let's say, it's become more and more apparent to me over the years that mythology isn't something that we retrieve from the past. It's more accurate to say that a mythology is something that we recreate for ourselves in the present based on artefacts that are older than our present moment. Yeah? So ancient texts, for example. And that to really get to grips with the mythological potential of any story, we really need to engage with it on a creative level. We need to engage with it as a myth. For me, the study of mythology has almost always been problematic because it's, it's as if mythology is only really, as an academic study now, it's only really a sophisticated form of classification, of classifying different types of story and discussing the relationships between these different classifications. But there is also another aspect to mythology, which is us drinking deeply of the stories themselves and coming to our own conclusions about what they mean. Now, as I said, that kind of interpretation is uh, frowned upon in 
many scholarly institutions these days, mainly because you can't pin it down. You can't build an objective argument about a text based on your own personal interpretation. But over the years, that's what I've become more and more interested in, is how do people react as individuals to texts? What is their own creative engagement with what's going on in the story? Of course, trying to inform and fill out that engagement with reference to historical or scholarly research, absolutely. But fundamentally, we create meaning for ourselves um, and we also create meaning in relation to others. So meaning is always inevitably located in us. So I don't have any problem with uh, developing these types of very personal interpretations so long as we're clear about that's what it is. Of course, it only gets problematic when we start claiming that our limited interpretation is in any way reflecting a historical reality. So what I'm going to be doing in many ways is reading uh, stories or episodes from the three romances and simply responding to them, of course accounting for my background in uh, study, in reading uh, medieval stories and in lots of the research that I've also been influenced by, but ultimately trying to come at them afresh, anew. Uh, to try and read them as if they had just been written yesterday and see what happens. Another reason for taking this approach is in many ways to address a criticism that sometimes arises during the courses that I run, particularly from people who have a very profound spiritual relationship, let's say, with the texts. And the complaint usually always runs along the same lines, and it is that, well, you've, you've just explained to me what the story means, but in doing that, you've reduced it and you've closed it off. You've killed it for me. You've pinned down the butterfly. There is no longer any engagement for me in this story because you've explained it all away and you've dispelled all of the mystery. In response, I would argue that that's actually uh, a mischaracterization of what I'm trying to do. Don't get me wrong, it is possible to interpret a text in that way, to take it apart, to fragment it, to dissect it, and to look at its innards and look at how it works, but to carry the metaphor through, once we've dissected the animal, we've also killed it. Yeah. So the thing that we're trying to study is no longer the thing that we're trying to study. The life that we were so enamoured with in the animal, by trying to find out what that life is, we've ultimately destroyed it. That great paradox of exploring anything. But I would argue that that's actually only one form of interpretation. It is a useful way of looking at story, undoubtedly to dissect stories, to even study the grammar and the syntax and the way that the words have been used um, and to compare those uses to other settings. That's all very useful, but it isn't the only way of interpreting a text. I would argue that a good interpretation always leads on to an, a further opening of the text, not to a closing of the text that it leads on to a further enlivening of our engagement with the story, as opposed to answering all our questions for us and dispelling all of the mystery. And I would argue that this mode of interpretation is actually more in keeping with what may have been the oral, oral storytelling tradition of Wales and the Celtic lands in general, if not Europe in general. As I tried to explain in the last video I did, uh, called Mabinogi Riddles, I tried to show how there are several places in the four branches themselves that suggest a reader or an audience member should try and read a deeper meaning in the text. That there are sometimes riddles, if you like, that require us to engage with them ask us to answer them. One of the more obvious riddles, of course, being Rhiannon on her white horse, moving ever so slowly and gracefully across the landscape, and yet no man on horseback or foot could ever catch her. 
And of course, Puich responds by saying, Ah, my Anari was stirhid. There is some magic meaning there, i.e., not just there is something strange going on here, but there is a magical meaning, a riddled meaning to this symbolic image. I argue that the four branches of the Mabinogi is stuffed to the rafters full of such images, and that when we approach those images in the right way, we can begin this other mode of interpretation where we are opening the text out all the time. Our interpretation never closes the meaning off, it simply feeds into further and further and further meanings that we can follow. As I was suggesting, I would say that that understanding of story is not only implied in the four branches of the Mabinogi, the sense that there is a deeper meaning that needs interpreting, and that when we interpret that deeper meaning, it should lead us on to further deeper understandings. There are other stories that also mention this quality of story. Um, and one story in particular from the Irish tradition, uh, the adventure of Cormac. It's found in two main recensions, or two of the earliest recensions at least, were probably from around the end of the 12th century. Uh, and the version that I'm referring to here is translated by John Carey, and it's in the Celtic Heroic Age, uh, that fabulous source book edited by John Cook, or John Cook. Now, I'm not going to go into what the adventure of Cormac is all about. It's a brilliant story. It's one of the main sources we have for Mananan MacLear, that great uh, divine hero of the Tuatha de Danann uh, in the Irish tradition. But I'm not going to go into detail about the story. I'm just going to look at some very suggestive episodes that tell us something about how the noble tradition of storytelling required its audience to respond to stories. And I say the noble tradition of storytelling because I'm not implying that every story storyteller in Ireland and Wales and the other Celtic lands intended for their audiences to always engage with their stories in this way. But it's clear that there were stories where this type of interpretation was required and was seen as the right way to approach the stories. So essentially in the adventure of Cormac, Cormac is kind of uh, led into the land of paradise, the land of wonder, the other world essentially, and there he witnesses some very strange things. Then Cormac found himself in the midst of a great plain. So Cormac has passed through mists and he's come out in the other world and he's witnessing these strange visions. There was a great stronghold in the midst of the plain and a silver rampart around it and a house half of gold in the midst of the stronghold, half thatched with the wings of birds and a troop of horsemen of the she gathering the wings of many coloured birds for the house. And they put those wings upon the house without a splinter, a fastener, yeah, to, to fasten them down. And they were falling off. And thus that troop of horsemen did from the beginning of the world until its end. It's a very strange image. Not that dissimilar to other images that we find, not only in Irish story, but also in Welsh story. But this image, this vision that Cormac sees, is actually interpreted for us later on in the story. As he makes his way through the other world, he eventually meets Mananan MacLear, uh, and there's a particular type of gathering between Cormac, Mananan MacLear, and a husband and wife, uh, where they share food, but without getting into too much detail, a big part of this meeting between these four is truth-telling, that telling the truth is uh, one of the main themes of this story, which is interesting because here we have truth-telling associated with interpretation. So this is how Mananan MacLear interprets this strange vision that Cormac has seen of these men trying to put multicolored bird wings up on a house to roof it yeah, and failing. So Mananan MacLear explains, the world from which you have come is the present world. The horsemen you saw thatching the house 
with uh, multicolored bird wings, are the skilled professionals of the world. And everything which they bring home after going on a circuit, going on a circuit means going out around the country uh, to practice their crafts, to sell their skills, to sell their wares. So everything which they bring home after going on a circuit melts away and decomposes into nothing while they're on the next circuit. So essentially, the wealth that they create by selling their craft, by selling their skills, turns to nothing while they're away working again, because of course it's consumed by their families. It decomposes into nothing while they're on the next circuit without profit or prosperity remaining. So there we have a pretty straightforward interpretation of this symbolic image. The reason why they're failing to put a roof on this house with this sort of very glamorous and expensive um, and luxurious roofing material, uh, the multicolored wings of special birds. The reason why they're failing to do that is because nothing that they do, nothing that they produce sticks. It's a very clear interpretation of this symbolic image. There's another symbolic Im image in the story as well. So after Cormac has witnessed uh, the horsemen of the Shi gathering the wings of many coloured birds for the house, he saw a warrior kindling a fire. He would fetch a great tree trunk, root and crown, and would put the trunk on the fire and go to fetch another, and nothing of the first tree trunk would be left when he returned. And this was the business and labour of that man from the beginning of the world until its end. So once again we have this very clear symbolic image that Mananan Maclear then goes on to explain like this, uh, the second part of this quotation now. As for the man kindling a fire, he is the victuallers and young noblemen of the world. So people that make booze, essentially. It is they themselves who consume everything which they labour to produce. So once again, the things that they create, they also consume them. Yeah, There is a production and a consumption, as with the first image. And whatever they consume this year, often they pay for it the next year. So we can see that this clearly would um, be appropriate for young noblemen in particular, in that they, we can imagine that they would be quite boozy, fond of their drink, and that they would consume a lot of drink. And they would always be continually paying off the debt for this drink. So once again, it's a symbolic image that has a pretty straightforward meaning. Yeah, It's kind of allegorical in many ways. Not so much in that there is um, a complex narrative that means something, but there is an event, an episode, people doing things that have another meaning. Now, taken with what I discussed in the other video on Mabinogi riddles, this idea that many of the stories in the Celtic tradition in general appear to suggest these deeper meanings, I would say that approaching them in that way is kind of in keeping with parts of the tradition. In this Irish story, The Adventure of Cormac, what we really have is an explanation, a meaning that closes off the story. It's kind of a simplified version of interpretation. This is the symbolic image and this is its meaning. We could, of course, go on to try and give alternative interpretations for these symbolic images. What our interpretations require is that they have an internal logic. Just like Mananan MacLear's interpretations, this is what they mean. We can see how the symbol corresponds in some way to the real world events that it's uh, standing for. Yeah? We can see a similarity between the two. If we move on from that type of interpretation, we can really get into some very interesting places. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, Mananan MacLear's interpretation of is, of course, the authoritative, single, closed-off interpretation of those images. But there are plenty of events in stories from the Celtic storytelling tradition in Ireland and in Wales and elsewhere, where there is no explicit answer given, where 
it appears as if the symbols, the symbolic images and events and actions that are described to us appear to have not just one meaning, but potentially a multitude of meanings. Even though they are clearly symbolic, even though they clearly do have another meaning, it's never just one meaning. A good example of this is, of course, the example I gave a couple of weeks back now when I was talking about uh, the unnamed Queen course uh, of Puig spending a year in Anoven. So this young nobleman, uh, in the guise of a wild spirit, the hunter, Araun, in Araun's kingdom, the other world, other world, Anoven, the sacred dimension, if you like, and that while he's there, he is given the opportunity to sleep with Aaron's wife, the unnamed queen. But even though he could easily do that because he's in the magical guise of her husband, he doesn't. Instead, he refrains from doing that. Now, the mundane explanation for this symbolic event, and it's the explanation that the vast majority of uh, academics will reach for is that Poish is proving his honour, that he is showing that he uh, is respecting his friend Aaron by not taking advantage of his wife. That it's this kind of boys' club thing where even though Aaron has said, "Hey, you can sleep with the most beautiful woman in the world, and I don't care," Poish has decided, "No, I will be honourable and I will refrain from taking advantage of this beautiful unnamed queen." Fine. That's a fair enough explanation, but it's by no means the only explanation. For example, what if the unnamed queen could stand in as an embodiment of the sovereignty of David? What if she is, in some ways, uh, an embodiment of the land? Very romantic 19th century type of interpretation but it's one that we could easily make there's plenty of similar stories not only in the Welsh tradition but also in the Irish tradition and all over the world where such women do stand for that they do embody uh, the land the, the united power of the land in many ways the indivisible political nature of one country yeah? if so then Poet is also learning to not take advantage of the land which he supposedly governs. So that's another interpretation. Another interpretation could be, well, she is the queen of Anoven. She is the female power who represents the sacred dimension. So Poich is not only honouring his friend Aaron by not sleeping with her, he's not only honouring her by not taking advantage with her, he's not only potentially uh, learning about honouring the land which he governs as the Prince of Doved, he is also learning to not take advantage of the sacred dimension itself. That is another further interpretation. Now, of course, I can't prove that any of these interpretations are historically valid. I can't prove that any of these interpretations ran through the minds of audience members listening to the four branches of the Mabinogi a thousand years ago. I can't do that. But I don't think it's a massive leap of the imagination to sometimes reach these conclusions. And if I can reach these conclusions, then undoubtedly someone in the past could also reach them because we haven't changed that much as human beings. Our culture has evolved, yes. But generally speaking, our creative intellect remains pretty much the same. The brain hasn't changed that much in the last 10,000 years. So there you can see where there are further and further interpretations that we can always open. And that last interpretation that I ended with there, this notion of Puig uh, as a mortal sitting in the sacred dimension, learning how not to treat the sacred dimension as his playground, as a fantasy, as somewhere where he can simply fulfil his wildest lusts and dreams. That obviously has a symbolic implication for the ego, for how we think the sacred dimension should be and how it should satisfy our deepest desires to be enlightened, spiritual, powerful, magical beings. Yeah? There's a, a great lesson in there, I would suggest. But of course, that's not the only implied lesson. We can take that further and further and further again.
There's always more that can be interpreted if we're interpreting well. Now, of course, what I am calling good interpretation is by no means what many people involved in scholarly research would consider to be good interpretation. They would probably consider it to be subjective, flawed, uh, inconsequential, not relevant to the field of study. Uh, and that's fine. Doesn't mean that it's not important, though. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place in our engagement with the story. So that's where I'm going to be coming from with uh, the three romances. I'm hopefully going to be discussing them over the next two months, maybe three months, depending on how it goes. As I said, it's not going to be scholarly research. It's going to be creative engagement. I'll refer to a little bit of the research that's been going on over the years, of course. That would be a natural thing to do. But ultimately, it's a focus on my instinctive interpretation of the text. And I hope that you find it interesting. And you're more than welcome to ask questions and to give suggestions in the comments while I'm doing it.